Okay. Well, um, at this point we want to talk about coulometry as a method for analysis. We've talked about coulometry as a, a bulk electrolysis. Let's talk about coulometry when it's used as an analytical method, which is, as I said, used quite a bit in um, for titration type situations and so on. And usually the variant that people are interested in is constant current. Coulometry. Where the idea is to supply at all times a constant current, which means that the rate of charge into the system is constant. So if the current is constant, the amount of charge is just the applied current times the time that we actually do the reaction for. So just so simply by measuring the time, we can determine the amount of charge since I applied is fixed. And because current is flowing in constantly, we can use that as a, as, as I said, as, as a titrant. We can use the electrons coming in as a titrant or we can generate some solution space titrant with those electrons to do a subsequent reaction. And just like opening a burette stopper, we can, we can run in the solution, we can run in the electrons in that particular way. And that works fine. Let's consider though what happens when we use constant current coulometry to do a detection of a species. Here's the current and let's suppose we're applying a certain amount of current to our system. Our, let's suppose our current voltage curve looks like, like so, where here is our reaction of interest. This species O is being reduced at the particular point. Now if we apply a constant current at this point, the reaction will occur and some of the material will be removed by electrolysis, converted to say species R. So after a period of time, some of the material will be removed and we will have a current potential curve that would look like so. Still no problem. After another period of time, we might have a curve that looks like this and then like this, and then perhaps like this. As we continue to remove the material from the solution, of course, this uptick here I'm indicating is the second process in the system. There's always some additional reaction that's occurring. That's sufficiently negative potentials. Everything's pretty cool until we get to that curve's okay, that curve's okay. What about this curve here? Now we've got a problem because I applied is greater than I limiting because we've removed so much of the initial material, all of it, and we can, we're no longer able to do that reaction. So some of the current will go to reducing O still, but a lot of it, or some, a fraction of it, in this case a small fraction, but a fraction nonetheless, will be involved in doing that second, secondary reaction. And that will continue as we remove more and more of the material until we get to a point, say, in this, at this curve where the majority of the current is going to the secondary process. So that's gonna be a problem because if we wanna use coulometry to quantitatively do something, now we've got a large amount of additional current flowing that's not doing anything at all for the pr purpose that we'd like. It's going into that secondary effect. In other words, we're not gonna get 100% current efficiency if we do our reaction this way. Now the solution would be, a poor solution would be to drop our I applied um, to very low levels. Of course, that would make, uh, make the reaction take a very long time to complete, so that's not a good solution. We could try to vary the applied current with time. Uh, the problem with that is um, we don't really know what the reaction, how complete the reaction is, so it's not always a convenient way to do it. A better way to do it is to use, uh, do what they do with coulometric titrations. And let's, let's take a look 
you had a typical coulometric titration. A common coulometric titration is to use, to use electrons to determine the amount of material. Iron uh, is a typical species that people use coulometric titrations for. For example, to determine the amount of iron 2 plus in, in solution. We can oxidize iron 2 plus to iron 3 plus plus an electron. So our coulometric titration curve would look like so. And um, initially we get a curve like this, where here is iron 2 plus plus, or going to iron 3 plus plus an electron. So that's, that's okay. Out here we're gonna oxidize water to uh, oxygen and protons and so on. So this would be our background process when we're doing this. Again, as long as we apply a sufficiently low level of current, we can do the, uh, we can remove iron two to iron three in this way. Again, as long as the concentration is high, but as soon as the concentration drops below that second level, we've got some trouble. And so what happens when we do we're in this situation. Well, here would be our curve. Now, again, we would see a lot of current now being used up just to generate oxygen at the, at the uh, electrode. That's not what we want to have happen. So what people do is they add in a, an additional oxidant that occurs at a higher oxidation potential. And that oxidation oxidant that they've added is generated electrochemically. So you start with a material like iron or cerium three plus. And the idea is that if we add some cerium three plus into the system, we would get a curve like so. And cerium four is a very strong oxidizing agent. So as soon as cerium four is made by the applied current, it will be available to oxidize other things in solution. One of what's in solution? Well, iron two is in solution, and as you can see by the difference in the potential is that the potential is sufficiently positive to oxidize iron two directly. So initially, when we have just iron two in solution and we apply our current, no trouble, uh, but if we add, as, a, as an additional amount, a, an excess amount of cerium-3 in the solution, initially we'll be applying current and we'll be mostly involved in oxidizing iron-2 to iron-3. However, as soon as we get to a situation like here, where the current is lower than the I applied, the limiting current for iron-2 is less than that, we get to a point where now we're going to start generating iron, our cerium-4 efficiently at the electrode itself. And so iron-2 plus cerium-4 goes rapidly and quantitatively to iron-3 plus cerium-3. Cerium-3 is regenerated, so it's effectively acting like a catalyst because as soon as we make cerium-3, it's going to get regenerated by the applied amount of uh, current. So the effective process here is to efficiently reduce iron or oxidize iron two to iron three. So as long as there's any iron two in that system, we'll be, um, we'll be uh, able to make cerium four to, to choose it, chew it up. The only question then is when is our reaction complete? Well, that's the next thing we have to ask ourselves. How do we know when the coulometric titration is done? When is all the iron three plus finished? Well, we could do it in a couple different ways. One way that would be not very accurate would be to measure the electro or the potential of the solution itself. And remember, we've got a Nernst situation here when if we have iron two and iron three in the solution, there's gonna be a equilibrium potential for those two species. And we could measure that, and that would slowly shift positive as more and more iron three are produced. 
as soon as we got into the point where iron two is all gone, there's no possibility for an equilibrium to be in place. And so the potential of the solution would shift to the point where the cerium three, four equilibrium has taken place. So by monitoring the solution potential, we could actually see, okay, we've shifted from this potential, which is gonna slowly shift negative during the course of the titration, to this potential, which would be a very abrupt shift, and we could monitor that particular point. And that would be a good way to detect the end. Not the most precise way, though. Let's, let's think about some better ways to do it, though. Here would be the typical coulometric titration process. Here we have two electrodes. Ah. With some sort of current source supplying the current for the reaction. At one electrode we'll call the generator, which would be equivalent to the working electrode in a in a normal cell. The other electrode would be a counter electrode, and typically the counter electrode would be enclosed in some sort of a fritted container or some sort of porous membrane to avoid uh, the other products being formed at that electrode mixing with the system. And then to do the detection, we have a separate electrochemical circuit, which would be a, a an electrode, an indicating electrode, and a reference electrode. To do the process. So what these would do, this is these two would have the current flowing through it to do this reaction here. These detector electrodes would be measuring the potential of the solution at any particular point. All right. Now. Of course, in these sort of situations, we'd be stirring the system up very efficiently to make sure that we're not limited by the rate of mass transport. We want to have material come to the electrode as fast as possible. All right. Now, Coulometric titrations like this are, are, are particularly sensitive because we don't need to, for example, we have a, a source of titrant that it, no need for standardization. We have an electrochemical or electronic source of current and we don't need to standardize our source of current. As long as we know the current that's flowing, that's what it is. Unlike, say, a sodium hydroxide standardization, where we'd have to worry about the sodium hydroxide absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and changing the molarity of the carbon dioxide or the sodium hydroxide with time uh, and so on. We don't have to standardize our system. The other thing that we can do with coulometry is to generate titrants that are not particularly stable. We can generate cerium-4, which is fairly stable in acidic solution, but we can generate silver-2, which is not something you can uh, you can buy silver oxide, but that's not something you can typically put in a solution and expect it to stay as silver too. It's gonna to immediately decompose water. But you can generate it locally at the electrode and since the reaction is occurring only at the electrode, that will be sufficient. Um, chlorine gas can be generated and that would be a method to introduce chlorine gas without the difficulty and hazard of, a, say, a tank of chlorine gas at your, at your station simply by oxidizing chloride ions. Table in your book, 10.4.1, shows you some uh, coulometric titrants that you can generate using, uh, using that method. The other advantage of the coulometric titration is that you can do remote operations. Because the electrodes are, can be situated a long way away from the operator, you can have those reactions going on at some cell that's remote. Uh, and you don't have to have a complicated mechanical system say a burette yeah, being operated remotely, uh, much easier to operate, uh, say, simply a current flowing in and out of a system by, um, by a remote operator.